Last week, in the first video on this series about how to read your Bible, we went over the foundation of the scriptures, the Torah, the five books of Moses. This series is very important to me because from the beginning of this ministry, I have stressed the importance of reading the word. I've tried to illustrate the scriptures to entice people to read them. I've consistently given advice on how to start, like the advice of reading at least one chapter per day. This is important to me because I know that if the reading of the word was done, people would start to understand Yah more and they would be drawn more closely to him. We recognize that there are many different reasons why people are not reading, but in the end, none of those reasons matter, especially not today when things are heating up so fast in this world. The last video was important because it dealt with the foundation of the scriptures and like with everything else, our foundation is important. So if you have not watched that video, please do not start with this one before you have watched that one. But now that the foundation of the Torah has been set, this next video will deal with the excitement of the scriptures. The excitement of the scriptures is something that you don't normally hear when people speak about the Bible. This is often because people are not reading and they don't know what's really happening in this book. But the ironic thing is people watching all these action movies, watching all these trilogies and reading all these books like The Lord of the Rings with these big storylines. If you love those books and movies, there is no way you would not love these next books I'm about to discuss of the scriptures. It has everything those movies have, but more than that, it has guidance and wisdom from a historical perspective that allows us to understand, based on the successes and failures of Yasharel, what each of us can do in order to be prepared and ready for Yahuwah and be in a relationship with him. These next books are crucial to the understanding of the scriptures and understanding Yasharel. You cannot understand our Messiah before you understand the people he was sent to minister to. The understanding of them comes from the reading of these books. So instead of letting the devil deter you and demotivate you, let me do the opposite and motivate you to pick up the scriptures and read these wonderfully important books so that you can know what Yahweh desires of us and you learn to live for his will and you trust him. We must learn from Yasharel and that is what the reading of the scriptures will do for us. So let's discuss more about the reading of the Bible. Let's begin. The Book of Joshua Okay, well, let's be clear. When people want to talk about the name of our Messiah, it should be always known and clear that our Messiah has the same name as Joshua, son of Nun. But his name is not Joshua, but Yahusha, Yahusha, son of Nun. Now, in reality, if people wanted to translate our Messiah's name in English, it should be the same thing as the key figure in the Old Testament. But obviously, this is not so. You see, things start getting confusing when we start translating names, which is one reason we should not do it. But anyways, that's neither here nor there. The book of Yahusha describes the Israelites' conquest of Canaan. From the initial invasion across the Jordan River to the final division of the land, the book of Yahusha covers it. We went from understanding Yahweh's covenant with Yasharel in the five books of Moses, to now we're understanding the history of Yasharel and how Yahuwah delivered all his promises. But this is an action book. Much of this book is built upon what happened during war. So being that this is basically a book of military history, the book focuses on the leader who was Yahusha, son of Nun. So yes, a lot of this is a big war story. But the uniqueness to this military campaign is that though Yahusha was the leader on the ground, the commander himself was Yahuwah. The scripture says, And it came to pass, when Yahusha was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Yahusha went to him and said to him, Are you for us or our adversaries? So he said, No, but as commander of the army of Yahuwah, I have now come. And Yahusha fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does Adonai say to his servant? Then the commander of Yahuwah's army said to Yahusha, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Yahusha did so. That's Yahusha chapter 5 verses 13 through 15. This book 
repeatedly emphasizes that the Israelites' victories were due to Yahuwah's intervention. The extraordinary victory over Jericho dramatically demonstrated this. That's found in chapter 6. Yahuwah was decisively acting on the promises that he had made to Abraham. He was giving the land of Canaan to his people. This book of Yahusha describes a God who faithfully fulfills his promises. This is just a progression of understanding the covenant with his people. This account in this book is from a time period of more than 40 years after the exodus from Egypt. The scripture says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of Yahuwah, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly follow Yahuwah my Elohim. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed Yahuwah my Elohim. And now, behold, Yahuwah has kept me alive, as he said, these forty-five years, ever since Yahuwah spoke this word to Moses while Yasharel wandered in the wilderness. And now, here I am this day, eighty-five years old. That's Yahusha chapter 14, verses 7 through 10. I believe that clarity is important if we want to understand the time periods and where we are in their history. This book is about the conquest of Yah's people coming into their promised land. The two most prominent themes in this book are the possession of the land and the covenant. This book repeatedly emphasizes that the conquest of Canaan was a direct fulfillment of the promises given to Abraham, then to Isaac, then to Jacob, onto the succeeding generations. Since Yahuwah was demonstrating his faithfulness to Yasharel, he expected Yasharel to be faithful to his covenant with them. Possessing the land was based on their obedience to his law. For Yahuwah has driven out from before you great and strong nations, but as for you, no one has been able to stand against you to this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand, for Yahuwah your Elohim is he who fights for you, as he promised you. Therefore, take careful heed to yourselves that you love Yahuwah your Elohim, or else, if indeed you do go back, and cling to the remnant of these nations, these that remain among you, and make marriages with them, and go into them, and they to you, know for certain that Yahuwah your Elohim will no longer drive out these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps to you, and scourges on your sides and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from this good land which Yahuwah your Elohim has given you. That's Yahusha chapter 23 verses 9 through 13. I mean, that should be pretty clear and more to add to the foundation of understanding Yasharel. The book of Yahusha, which in English they call Joshua, it portrays the complete possession of the land as the result of obedience to Yahuwah's commands. Conquering the land enabled Yasharel to experience Yah's rest, which he had promised to the Israelites from the beginning. Remember the word which Moses, the servant of Yahuwah, commanded you, saying, Yahuwah, your Elohim, is giving you rest and is giving you this land. That's Yahusha chapter 1, verse 13. Now, not to get ahead of myself in the scriptures, but if we skip over to the Renewed Covenant epistles, in the book of Hebrews, the author equates this Old Testament concept of rest with entering into Messiah's rest, that is, his kingdom. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? but to those who did not obey. That's Hebrews chapter 3, verse 18. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. That's Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. For if Yahusha had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of Elohim. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased, from his works as Elohim did from his. That's Hebrews chapter 4 verses 8 through 10. I note this because in Christianity people often use the rest Messiah brings as a reason to not observe the Sabbath. But when you read the scriptures from the foundation, you see there is a difference in these rests. Because though Yahuwah fulfilled his promise and brought Yasharel rest, they still of course abided in the commandment and rested on the Sabbath day. 
It's two different concepts that you can only understand by reading the scriptures in full. This book is a very important book and is normally a place where people who want to read the Old Testament go to after Exodus if the law and other subjects push them away from continuing to read the rest of the book of Moses. So people do read this book, but if they skip the foundation that Moses laid, then you can see how there obviously would be a disconnect in understanding. Read this important book. There are only 24 chapters in the book, so it would not take long to get through. And because of the story, it definitely is an exciting book to read. So please read it, but only after you have read the five books of Moses. Let's continue on and see what's next. The Book of Judges This is another awesome historic lesson of Yasharel. The Book of Judges is a historical narrative that contrasts Yah's faithfulness with Yasharel's apostasy. Despite the repeated falling away of his people, Yahuwah provided deliverers to help bring the people out of their apostasy. These deliverers are referred to as judges. He did not spare Yasharel from the consequence of their actions, and we know this by their constant trouble from foreign oppressors. But Yahuwah delivered Yasharel from oppression because of his promises to Abraham and his descendants. You see, as we continuously read, we see that Yahuwah keeps his promises, and as we continuously read the different accounts of this, it helps build your confidence in him that he will be there for us to keep all the promises he has made in regards to our future. As we read this book, we know that the preservation of Yah's people was not due to their merit or their goodness, nor even to their willingness to repent, but Yahuwah demonstrated his compassion and pity on his people who were difficult to control because of their perverse behavior, people who continually grieved him. He demonstrated this compassion by providing bold leaders to rescue them. Nevertheless, Yahuwah raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. That's Judges chapter 2, verse 16. What we see in this book of Judges are the consequences of disobedience to Yah and the necessity of summoning a righteous king who would lead the people to Yahuwah. The book of Judges reveals that Yasharel began to disobey Yah even in the time of Yahusha, son of Nun. And that disobedience began to grow more serious. This is summed up very well in the second chapter, verses 16 through 23. It says, Nevertheless, Yahuwah raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with other gods and bowed down to them. They turned quickly from their way in which their fathers walked, and obeying the commandments of Yahuwah, they did not do so. And when Yahuwah raised up judges for them, Yahuwah was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For Yahuwah was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed them and harassed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers by following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. Then the anger of Yahuwah was hot against Yasharel. And he said, Because this nation has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and has not heeded my voice, I also will no longer drive out before them any of the nations which Yahusha left when he died, so that through them I may test Yasharel, whether they will keep the ways of Yahuwah to walk in them as their fathers kept them or not. Therefore, Yahuwah left those nations without driving them out immediately, nor did he deliver them into the hand of Yahusha. That's Judges chapter 2, verses 16 through 23. You see, Yasharel had a cyclical pattern of sin, slavery, and salvation that is the overall theme of this book of Judges. By the end of the book, it is clear that Yasharel had violated its covenant with Yahuwah in almost every imaginable way. If you want to know what not to do and what does not make you right in the sight of Yah, this is a book you must read. In this book, is where we get the famous story of Samson. These stories that they try to tell us in Sunday school, but we never really understood what was the real backstory behind them. This is why it's important to read these books, especially from the foundation. This book has only 21 chapters and it's an easy read. This is a fundamental book in understanding the history of Yasharel. 
Let's continue. The Book of Ruth. There's only two books of the Bible named after a woman, and this is one of them. This book is interesting to say the least, but after we read this story and understand the conclusion of where it leads, we see how perfect Yahuwah is and how faith truly matters. The Book of Ruth is a beautiful story of love, of loyalty, and redemption. This book tells the story of the salvation of Ruth, who was a Moabite. Through her relationship with her mother-in-law, Naomi, Ruth learned about Yahuwah and became his devoted follower. She abandoned her family and homeland, demonstrating both her love for her widowed mother-in-law and her faith in the God of Yasharel. Her faith was well-placed, and Yahuwah not only provided for her, but he placed her in the Messianic family line. This story takes place in the time of Judges, and this story of Ruth is a great contrast in comparison to what you would have just read in Judges. The book of Ruth is important because it brings out an important characteristic of Yahuwah that many Israelites today seem to miss. Yahuwah desires all to believe in him, even non-Israelites. This was his plan from the beginning and exactly what he would be using the covenant through Abraham to bring. Even though Ruth was a foreigner and was not familiar with Yah's law, she displayed a loyal love to her mother-in-law, Naomi. She left her homeland in order to be with Naomi in a time of need. Boaz showed the same type of love by protecting and providing for Ruth, a widow of one of his relatives. Yahuwah rewarded Ruth for her loyalty to him, blessing her with a child who would become the ancestor of King David and later our Messiah. You see, this book represents redemption. An example is Yahuwah's hand redeeming Ruth and Naomi from poverty. He controlled circumstances so that Ruth and Boaz would meet. He prompted Boaz to fulfill the responsibilities of the close relative. And he said, Who are you? So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. Then he said, Blessed are you of Yahuwah, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, and that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request. For all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Now, it is true that I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Stay this night, and in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you, as Yahuwah lives. Lie down until morning. That's Ruth chapter 3, verses 9 through 13. You see, the duty of a close relative is the obligation of providing an heir for Ruth's deceased husband. Dying without an heir was considered a tragedy, so to rectify the situation, the brother of a deceased man was expected to marry the widow in order to produce a child who would be considered heir of the deceased. This is called a leveret marriage, and you see it spoken of in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 10. This was the culture of the people. Boaz willingly took on this duty, even though he was not the closest relative. He brought the land from Naomi, married Ruth, and carried on the family name through the birth of their son. This is a beautiful story, and there are only four chapters of this account. It can be easily read in one day. It is a story that must be read that provides more understanding of faith and being set apart unto Yahuwah. Let's continue. Okay, so we're going to go over the next books. And I do not want to rush through them, but I will not go through them separately like I've done all the others, because each of these has two books. These are great books and cannot be emphasized enough of their importance. These books walk us through the history of Yasharel from the time of receiving a king. The Books of First and Second Samuel It is not possible for me to express the importance of these books right here enough. At the beginning of First Samuel, the nation of Yasharel was at a low point. The priesthood was corrupt. The Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines. Yasharel became dissatisfied with the abusive rule of the judges, which happened to be Samuel's sons. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. That's 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 3. Yasharel had evil leaders as role models. And the children of Yasharel showed open disdain for Yah's word, 
and they refused to listen to the prophet that Yah sent, who was Samuel. Instead of listening to Samuel, the people desired for the glories of a monarchy like they saw the other nations have. They wanted someone to go before them and represent them to the other nations. The scripture said, and they said to him, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. That's 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 5. So Yahuwah gave them their way. He gave them a king like the other nations, and this first king was Saul. And Yahuwah said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. That's 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7. And this first book walks us through this account of history. This is a crucial history to understand Yasharel from. It may throw people off because it's named after the prophet Samuel, but this book is loaded with history. Much of 1 Samuel deals with and tells the account of the confused life, reign, and decline of King Saul, while towards the end shows the rapid rise of the young and faithful King David. It is in this book we see the famous battle of David versus Goliath. This book provides an official account of the rise of the monarchy during the time of Samuel and the development of it under Saul and David. It is telling the story of the rise of King David. The first book has 31 chapters and it is a very interesting read. It must be read. Second Samuel is the second half of the story and it recounts the triumphs and defeats of King David. This book, covers the period from the death of Saul to the end of David's reign as king. During David's 40-year reign as king, he brought the tribes of Yasharel back together again under one strong kingdom and transformed the nation into a military power able to dominate the surrounding nations. After capturing the Jebusite fortress of Jerusalem, David made it his capital, and this became the power base for the establishment of David's empire. David began to free the Israelites' territory from the Philistines and Canaanite domination, and in doing so, he extended his kingdom by military conquest to the north, south, east, and west. And that's all in this book of 2 Samuel. That part you can find in chapter 8. David's conquests and alliances gave him control of territory from the border of Egypt to the Euphrates. For a brief period, Yasharel was as strong as any nation in the ancient world. This book of 2 Samuel tells the story of the establishment of the kingdom of Yasharel, and I don't think you can say you understand the Bible without getting to this point and understanding how we exactly got to this period of greatness in this biblical story. This book does not just record the greatness of David by his military conquests, but being a direct contrast and comparison to Saul. This book emphasizes that it was Yahuwah who rejected Saul for his disobedience and chose David for the throne and disciplined David for his pride, making David the true king of Yasharel. This was greatness. The key to David's successful reign was his relationship with Yahuwah. In 1 Samuel, Yahuwah describes David as a man after his own heart. But now your kingdom shall not continue. Yahuwah has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and Yahuwah has commanded him to be commander over his people, because you have not kept what Yahuwah commanded you. That's 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14. David is a true role model for those of us who desire to be found right in the eyes of Yahuwah. And that is what makes these two books so powerful and important to read. In his youth, David demonstrated his strong faith in Yah by challenging a giant with only a few stones and his faith in Yahuwah's strength. He grew up learning of the power of the God of Yasharel, and even though faith and obedience was dying out amongst his people, David believed and walked in power because of it. In these wicked times, I want myself and my sons to walk as David did. In his adulthood, he continued to rely on Yahuwah for guidance and strength. Scripture says, It happened after this that David inquired of Yahuwah, saying, Shall I go up to any of the cities of Yahuda? And Yahuwah said to him, Go up. David said, Where shall I go up? And he said, To Hebron. The second Samuel chapter 2, verse 1. Also it says, So David inquired of Yahuwah, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? And Yahuwah said to David, Go up, 
for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 19. This is a real example of a relationship with Yahuwah. It's a great example. Also, something about David, he eagerly wanted to build a temple for the glory of Yahuwah. Now it came to pass when the king was dwelling in his house and Yahuwah had given him rest from all his enemies all around that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of Elohim dwells inside tent curtains. Then Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for Yahuwah is with you. The second Samuel chapter 7 verses 1 through 3. David did not build the temple, but he laid the important groundwork and prepared the way for his son Solomon to complete it. He also wrote numerous songs of praise to Yah and led the Israelites back to true worship of Yahuwah. Even when he sinned, he demonstrated to the people his repentant heart before Yah. Through all the triumphs and tragedies of David's reign, we saw Yahuwah act through all the peoples in order to accomplish his will. Yahuwah gave David a glimpse of his ultimate will and the promises that he gave him. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. The second Samuel chapter 7 verses 12 through 16. You see, in this unconditional covenant, Yahuwah promised David an eternal dynasty, an eternal throne, and an eternal kingdom. And from this point on, when the prophets would speak of the coming Messiah, they referred to him as David or the son of David, because this was the part of the promise Yahuwah made with David for Yasharel and the world. Ultimately, we all know that a more righteous king, greater than David, came. He descended from David and would rule from David's throne forever. This promised king is Yahusha. So there's 31 chapters in 1 Samuel and 24 chapters in the second. All highly important in understanding the great king of Yasharel, who we can use as a role model to be like so that we can be men and women also after Yahuwah's own heart. Let's continue. First and second kings. Let me ask you, do you love history? Well, I do. When you know the past, you can understand more about the present. People don't realize that the Bible is a big history book that when it is read, it can bring so much clarity about this world that we're living in right now. First and second Samuel went over a great deal of history and so does first and second Kings. First Kings is the story of one group of people headed down two different paths. It is the story of good kings and bad kings, true prophets and false prophets, and of disobedience and loyalty to Yahuwah. The first 11 chapters of 1 Kings deals with Solomon. The book explains Solomon's rise. It highlights his godly wisdom. At Gibeon, Yahuwah appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and Elohim said, Ask, what shall I give you? And Solomon said, You have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne, as it is this day. Now, O Yahuwah, my Elohim, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, but I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? The speech pleased Yahuwah that Solomon had asked this thing. Then Elohim said to him, Because you have asked this thing, and have not asked long life for yourself, nor asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice, behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart, so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. 
and I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. So if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. That's 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 through 14. Solomon had many building projects, none more important than the building of the temple. There are some really good chapters here, like must read chapters like chapter 8, when the ark is brought into the temple. I mean, it's wonderful stuff. But Solomon had spiritual failures toward the end of his reign, and they were major. And after his death, the kingdom of Yasharel was divided. The kingdom was divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom made up of the ten tribes, which is known as Yasharel, and the southern kingdom made up of only two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and it is known as Yahuda. The narrative of First Kings stretches from the high prosperity of Solomon's kingdom to the insecurity and breaking up of the kingdom moving into the mid 9th century BC. During this period, the internal spiritual weakness of the two Israelite kingdoms was beginning to take shape, and this book covers this era of dramatic change. 1 Kings has 22 chapters. 2 Kings continues the history of the divided kingdom from the point where 1 Kings ends. It traces the events of both the kingdoms of Yasharel and Yahuda. And while doing so, it brings out the prophetic ministries of Elijah and Elisha, chapters 1-9. through nine. During this period, the northern kingdom faced continued pressure from Assyria. The northern kingdom of Yasharel started to worship Baal, and they entered a time of rapid decline that mirrored its spiritual condition. The combined effects of spiritual apostasy and moral debauchery, together with unwise political entanglements with Assyria, ultimately brought the northern kingdom to its end in 722 BC. The remainder of 2 Kings deals with varying fortunes and spiritual pilgrimage of the southern kingdom, tracing Yahuda's history from the righteous Hezekiah to the wicked sons of Josiah, under whom Jerusalem faced three invasions and deportations until the last in 586 BC. In this history, Yahuda was led away captive and their exile would last 70 years. Second Kings ends on a tragic note. It says, Now it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and encamped against it, and they built a siege wall against it all around. So the city was besieged until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. By the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then the city wall was broken through, and all the men of war fled at night by the way of the gate between two walls which was by the king's garden, even though the Chaldeans were still encamped all around against the city. And the king went by way of the plain, but the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king, and they overtook him in the plains of Jericho. All his army was scattered from him. The second Kings chapter 25 verses one through five. It continues. And in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He burnt the house of Yahuwah and the king's house, all the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the houses of the great, he burned with fire. And all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls of Jerusalem all around. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive the rest of the people who remained in the city and the defectors who had deserted to the king of Babylon with the rest of the multitude. The second Kings chapter 25 verses 8 through 11. There's 22 chapters in first Kings and 25 chapters in second Kings. Both books, again, a must read if you want to understand the history of this biblical people and how we got to the point of the renewed covenant. Imagine saying, you know, Yah, but you have his word right there in your hand, but you don't know a thing about any of this. This is all highly important to apply to our understanding. All in all, even through all of the downfall of the divided kingdom of Yasharel, after they split, there is still a symbolic message that is clear. That message is, Yahuwah would still fulfill his promise to restore his people. Solomon prays to Yahuwah, When they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them and deliver them to the enemy, 
and they take them captive to the land of the enemy, far or near. Yet when they come to themselves in the land where they were carried captive and repent and make supplication to you in the land of those who took them captive, saying, We have sinned and done wrong. We have committed wickedness. And when they return to you with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies who led them away captive and pray to you toward their land, which you gave to their fathers, the city which you have chosen and the temple which I have built for your name, then hear in heaven your dwelling place, their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you and all their transgressions, which they have transgressed against you and grant them compassion before those who took them captive that they may have compassion on them. For they are your people and your inheritance, whom you brought out of Egypt, out of the iron furnace, that your eyes may be open to the supplication of your servant and the supplication of your people, Yasharel, to listen to them whenever they call to you. For you have separated them from among all the peoples of the earth to be your inheritance, as you spoke by your servant Moses, when you brought our fathers out of Egypt, O Yahuwah Elohim. That's 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 46 to 53. And hallelujah. When we continue on reading, we see that he answers this prayer and still keeps his promises, which is why I'm so personally confident to this day in my love and trust in him. And I am imploring you to do the same thing that Solomon just asked in prayer to happen to us if after our captivity we turn back to Yahuwah. Go back and repent and turn back to him with all your heart. So that is what we must be doing and the first step starts with the reading of his powerful, wonderful word. Hallelujah. Let's continue. After First and Second Kings, we have First and Second Chronicles. This is just another account of that same history, but it is a book that provides continuity. For time's sakes, I think I will cover it at a later time, because though it does cover a lot of the same stuff, it is written at a different time for a different reason, and we need to understand that. From here with the books that we just went over, it should not be surprising to you why you need to read the scriptures. The devil is deterring us from the reading of these holy scriptures because the more we grow in knowledge and understanding of Yahuwah and his children, the more conviction we have to live righteously and not make the same mistakes as those who lived before us. So the less we read the word, the less we understand that we are just repeating the mistakes of the past. We must read these scriptures and become biblically aware of the world that we're in. The scriptures were preserved for a reason. Imagine that we have this invaluable resource in our hand with all this history, all this prophecy, all this evidence of Yahuwah keeping his promises, and we ignore it to watch basketball, cooking shows, scrolling on TikTok, or focus on making dollar bills that had that eye of Lucifer upon it. We have his word and we must read it so that we can learn how to live for him and please him. And now you have been given more of a breakdown of what is exactly in this wonderful book. Pick it up and read it daily and let the love and knowledge of our creator fill you up and draw you into a closer relationship with him. The scriptures must be read. And I hope that after watching these last two videos, you feel more compelled and drawn to reading this yourself. The word is awesome. And I pray that you experience just how wonderful and powerful it is too. I hope you can share this with others in your family and with your friends and they begin to read the word too. There is nothing more important and I pray that we all recognize this now and make the reading of his word a priority of our life. Burn your idols, brothers and sisters. Put down everything else and pick up your Bible and read it. Read it like your life depends on it because like I keep saying, it does. Be blessed. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. Okay. Thanks again for watching. If this has blessed you, please don't forget to like this and share it with others. If you haven't done so already, please don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Yah willing, I upload every Friday. Also, please don't forget to follow this ministry on Facebook and Instagram as well as subscribing to my website at truthunedited.com. Listen, I'd like to thank all those who donate and support this ministry. I thank you sincerely. You have been a true blessing to this ministry, and you have allowed me to continue on with this assignment. I thank you for the bottom of my heart. You know who you are. Be blessed. Okay, 
Thanks again, everyone, for watching. I love you all.